that is rooted and grounded in the three angels' message. And oftentimes when we have this three angels' message, people hear about the beast, the mark of the beast, and they get terrified. But this is a message that the Lord sent at the beginning of the end of time to declare to man, to humanity, what their work should be in order for us to stand before God in the judgment. And in the last day, just before Christ should come, we have this message to tell us how to be ready. This message in Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 to 12 is a threefold message. And you may look on the screen and you should all know this by heart. As it says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell unto the earth, on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a what? Loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made what? All nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. They are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Let us pray. Precious Father in heaven, we thank you for this message. And though it may sound to be the most fearsome warning, there is something in this message that all the world needs to see, to hear, to know, and to understand. And we pray that your spirit will teach us today so that when Jesus shall come, we shall meet him in peace. Bless us and may your spirit lead and guide. Therefore, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What is found in this message that indicates the importance? First, we know that these messages are symbolized by angels flying in heaven. Now, these angels are symbolic. For the work of preaching has never been assigned to angels. Do you know that? The work of preaching the gospel has been assigned to humans. You may recall even when the angels came to Cornelius. They could have preached the gospel to Cornelius, but they said, no, go and send for Peter. Because angels don't preach the gospel. Angels assist us. Angels help us. Angels protect us. But we are the ones who preach the gospel. Amen. If God was using angels to preach, the world work would have been finished a long time. Because angels are united. Angels are not lazy. Angels are not greedy. Angels are not tired and, and, and easily discouraged. And they would fly around the world and the gospel would have been preached a year after Jesus died and the end would have come. So we are the ones commissioned to preach the gospel. But it's in the midst of heaven, in mid-air, because there's an urgency. Fear God and give glory to him. Now I want to tell you I could 
individually for each section of this message. I could break it down. Fear God, one whole message. Give glory to him, another message. The hour of his judgment has come, another message. Worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. That's another message. And all of it is focused on who? God. And we hear this interlude in between about the beast and his mark. But our God is saying, not him. Don't worship the beast. At the end of the message it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So if you really stop and consider the message, the message is really about Jesus. Everyone should know. This three angels message is a message about Jesus. Fear God. Give glory to God. The hour of God's judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountain. It's all about God. At the end of it, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In other words, this message is an exhortation, a plea, a beg, a begging us. It's directing us, it's commanding us to focus on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, has this injunction that is given to all Christians. Let me get this right. Right. Okay, there we go. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Consider him is the title of our sermon. You see, the Bible is telling us, urging us to consider Christ continually and intelligently. Just as he is, um, he will transform us into a perfect Christian because by beholding, we become changed. Did you know that? Hebrews um, 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says, But we all, with open faith, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. By beholding, we become changed. By beholding Christ, we become changed into his image. And that is what the three angels' message wants us to do. Ministers and teachers of the gospel therefore have an inspired license for keeping the theme Christ continually before the people and directing the attention of the people to him alone. If by God's grace I visit and preach any other time, I preach nothing but Jesus Christ. Because he is the savior of the world. In fact, the apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2. And his preaching was no different in all the churches. Notice in the Galatians church, it says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Galatians 1, 15 and 16. And his joy was to him to preach among to the Ephesians, the, the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Ephesians 3, verse 8. All Paul was doing was preaching Jesus. Now, the apostles all did the same thing. They made Christ the burden of their teaching. And that was not, and that is not the sole reason for us to magnify Christ. Why? Because his name 
is the only name under heaven given among men. Whereby what? Whereby we can be saved. And Christ himself declared that no man, no woman, no boy, no girl, no child can come to the Father except by him in John 14, verse 6. And you know, he said to Nicodemus in John 3, 14 and 15, and as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This lifting up of Jesus, while it has the primary reference to his crucifixion, it embraces more than historical fact. It means that Christ must be lifted up by all who believe in him as the crucified redeemer, whose grace and glory are sufficient to supply the world's greatest need. He must be lifted up in all his exceeding loveliness and power as God with us, that his divine attractiveness may draw all unto him. Lift him up. Consider him. We know the call to consider Jesus and the reason are also given in Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 to 3. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Then it says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your minds. You know, this cloud of witnesses, if you read Hebrews 11, represents the saints of old. Some of them were slaughtered. Some of them were running and hiding in dens and caves and rocks. They were the, the scum of the earth. They were hated. They were persecuted. They were treated in all sorts of evil ways. But the scripture says in a most touching verse, but of these the world is not worthy. These heroes are above this world. The world cannot be compared to them because they kept their faith in Jesus. They considered him and they gave up all for him and they didn't consider their lives worthy to hold on to if they were going to deny Jesus. They said, no, let me die for Jesus. And so we have this great cloud of witnesses telling us to consider him Run with endurance this race that is set before us. He said, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him. And what was that joy? Jesus was considering that you and I and others will be redeemed, will be rescued from sin, will be taken home to live with him for eternity. And he says, no matter what I must go through, I see the joy I will have with my people after this is over. And I am not giving up. I will go through the cross. I will endure the shame. And I will deliver my people. And so the scripture says, consider him. Lest you become weary and enfeebled. You know, it is by prayerfully and consistently considering Jesus as he's revealed in the Bible that we keep from becoming weary in well-doing and from fainting by the way. So I tell you, consider him. Again, we should consider Jesus. We should consider Jesus for in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Colossians 2 verse 3. 
in Jesus is hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I don't know what happens to my slide. I will probably forget it. Whoever lacks wisdom is directed to ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraids not in James 1 verse 5. And the promise is that it shall be given. But the desired wisdom can only be obtained in Christ. The wisdom which does not proceed from Christ and which does not as a result lead to Christ is only foolishness. For God is the source of all things, is the author of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And ignorance of God is the worst sort of foolishness. Amen. Romans 1, 21, 22 tells us, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. All these professors and scientists who speak about evolution, they are fools. God created us in his image. And I want to tell you there is some wonderful stuff about why God created us in his image. And if we think that God's image is simply about character. But it is more than that. God actually created us to be like him. And I don't just mean character. I mean we shall live and reign with Christ forever. We shall be like God in every way short of being God himself. And that is what the devil wants to wipe from our memories. And so they come up with all these theories to destroy our heritage, our knowledge, and to destroy our hope, and to destroy our pursuit of God. Because when we know what God has in store for us, then we consider him. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in Christ. So that he who has only the wisdom of this world in reality knows nothing. All power, Jesus said, in heaven and earth is given unto me. And Jesus is the power and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1.24 So there is one text which sums up what Christ is to man. The most comprehensive reason for considering him. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Listen, we are ignorant. We are wicked. We are lost. But Christ is to us wisdom and righteousness sanctification and redemption without the righteousness of Christ we have nothing without Christ we are fools without Christ we can't be sanctified without Christ we can't be redeemed Christ is to us everything no human has any righteousness to plead one case with God none so when the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who what, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You know, there are some Bible say, and their faith in Jesus. That is wrong. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but what? Christ that what? Liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, it is that faith that kept Jesus on the cross. It is that faith that allowed Jesus to go through all that he endured will take us through the end of time. The very faith of Christ because Christ will be living in us. He will be 
working in us. It is his righteousness. It is mighty acts. Not us. So Christ is righteousness for us. Christ is sanctification for us. We can't be sanctified without Christ. We can't be redeemed without Christ. A, new, a most beautiful text in us tells us Christ in us, the hope of glory, the mystery of godliness is Christ in us. Consider him. Don't think about preachers and men and women and all those people out there. They can't do you a thing. They can't give you salvation. They can't make your life better. So consider him. So we are going to look now at some brief ways in which we can consider him. In the first part of the Gospel of John, you know, John, I'm Jonathan, so John is my favorite book. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. You know, there was a time I was memorizing the Gospel of John. I went through three chapters, and I saw so many things in there. I, I tell you, it was joy to my heart. And this word, we know from verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This word is Jesus. And here we consider him as what? As God. And not only God, but creator. It says all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now I know you all know this. But just in case there is somebody listening somewhere who doesn't know. When the three angels message say worship him. Who made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. I'm speaking about Jesus. All things. And that, of course, takes us back to the fourth commandment. Full of grace and truth. And then there are some people who think Jesus was created to be a God. Some foolish doctrines. A little God, but not the real God. But no, the scripture says... In Micah 5 verse 2, but thou, that's like 700 years before Christ, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. How should we consider Christ? He is the creator. From the beginning was with God, equal to God, and yet existed from everlasting, infinite in all things. He is the eternal God. Amen. Yes, he is. Jesus is our creator. And when, you, and when I call upon you to consider him, this acknowledgement... His rightful role should be the first and foremost amongst our considerations. Jesus is God. He is creator. He is eternal God, almighty God, everlasting God, nothing but God. And his role shall not be diminished permanently God. How again? Should we consider him? You know, Jesus made another statement about himself. In the fifth chapter of John, John 5, 22 and 27, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. So when the three angels message said the hour of his judgment has come, he's talking about Christ. Consider him as judge. The highest prerogative of any ruler is judging. That was the chief job of the kings. 
Solomon was famous as the famous king because of his judgment. It wasn't his riches. It was his judgment. God himself, Jesus, creator, is judge. The highest work to be done at the end of time is to be judged. And only one who has the highest office can perform this role. How again shall we consider him? How again? In Isaiah 33, 22, it says, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Christ is also the lawgiver. This can be verified when we look at how the children of Israel came out of Egypt. In Numbers 21, verse 46, speaking about when they journeyed from Mount Hor, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And these people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loads this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. So the people of Israel spoke against God and Moses. Hey, what happened to you? Why did you bring us here? To kill us? They found fault with the leader, and they were destroyed by serpent. Here is what the inspired apostle said in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 9. Neither let us who tempt who? Christ. As some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Yes, it was Christ they were tempting. In fact, when Moses was called to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, he esteemed, Hebrews chapter 11 tells us, the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Hebrews eleven twenty six, And Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 4 wrote, All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So Christ was the leader who took them out of Egypt. Christ was the leader who took them to Mount Sinai. Christ was the leader who proclaimed that law. Christ was the leader who wrote it with his ten, wrote those ten commandments with his finger. Christ yeah. is the lawgiver. Christ is the judge. And yet we sin against God by breaking his law. But we must consider him. He is the one who gives the law. And he is the one who is going to judge us. Ought we not therefore consider him? How again shall we consider him? Let us consider him in another role. John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now this could not tell us any clearer that Christ was both God and man. Originally only divine. He took upon himself human nature and passed among men as a common mortal. And Paul expounded on it, Philippians 2, 5 to 8, when he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Amen. Hebrews 1 3 tells us that Christ, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Christ is very much like God, having all attributes of God, the ruler of the universe, the one in whom heaven all delighted to honor. He did not think these things worthy to be desired. So long as men and women were lost and without strength, Christ said, I cannot enjoy my glory. I cannot wear this crown. I cannot keep on these robes when my people who I created to be like me are lost and without hope. I have to go down 
and enjoy their experience. I have to go down and become a part of them. I have to go down and show that I know what they are going through. I have to be like my brethren so that I can feel their afflictions. I can know their pain. I know their worries. I know their troubles. I know their weaknesses. I have to go there and be like them. Amen. Consider him. He emptied himself. Divested himself of all his riches and his glory. Now we cannot tell how Christ as God could humble himself to the death of the cross. And it is worse than useless to speculate about it. Just accept the fact. Wonderful manifestation of love. The innocent suffering for the guilty. The just suffering for the unjust. The creator suffering for the creature. The maker of the law suffering for the transgressor of the law. The king suffering for his rebellious subjects. God did not spare his own son. The scripture says in Romans 8, 32. Did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Hello? You think Jesus just came just to do a little thing and disappear? How shall he not freely give us what? All things. Infinite love could find no greater manifestation of itself. So what well may the Lord say as in Isaiah 5 or 4. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? The mighty God became a human to be sacrificed for our sins. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not only did he die for us, bearing our sins, but he rose again from the grave. Hallelujah. Up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain. And he lives forever and forever to reign. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. The conqueror of death and the grave. He has the keys. And anyone who has come under the power of the grave, Christ can turn that key and let him out. So consider him. You know, there is a big debate out in Christendom about preaching to the spirits in prison. One day I'll have to come back and tell you about that. You really need to know what the scriptures is saying about that, about the resurrection of Christ. But we will now continue to consider him. What I'm just giving you are some introductory considerations that you need now to spend time to go and consider him some more. How else shall we consider Christ? In when Jesus was going away, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me in my father's house. Are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Hello? Amen. He's coming again. In case you don't believe it, he's coming again. In case you didn't settle it in your mind, consider this. He is coming again. And yeah, we better be ready. I go and prepare a place where I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there we may be also. Jesus, and all that he has done, has one aim in mind. It's for us to be with him forever. So he returned to heaven, but he's coming again. But before he comes, we know that Jesus is in heaven as our heavenly intercessor, as our high priest. Amen. 
So let's consider him. Hebrews chapter 7, 24 and 25. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus was made like his brethren. He says we must come boldly to the throne of grace in the time of need so we can get grace to help because he knows just what we have been through. He has been there. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. So he says, I know what you feel. And the scripture says, in all our afflictions, he is afflicted. Did you know that? Every pain that you feel, Jesus feels it. Every loneliness that you go through, he's there trying to comfort you because he knows loneliness. When you feel hungry, Jesus knows those hunger pangs. When you're tired and weary, Jesus knows it too. There is nothing in this life that you can experience that Jesus doesn't know. Jesus knows our weaknesses, our inherited and cultivated tendencies to sin. And even though sin is against him, against his law, he said, I am pleading for you. You know, sometimes we deliberately go out of the wrong way to sin. And the devil stands at our right hand and says, let me kill him. Let me kill her. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus has to plead his blood. My father. My father. I died for that one. Hold back. Don't let the devil take his life. Don't let the devil take her life. Jesus is not pleading against the father. Because the father loves us too. He's pleading against the devil who wants to kill us when we rightfully deserve death. He is our heavenly intercessor. There is no need for us to strive hopelessly in sin. When we have a big brother, a faithful high priest, who can give us strength. So now I'm preaching to myself too. Have you been praying for something for a long time? And the answers just don't seem to come. Have you been toiling in prayer? And it's like God has forgiven, forgotten me. Have you been there saying, my way is not known by the Lord? Have you been thinking that somehow you are nothing in God's sight? Are you thinking that perhaps you are too sinful for God to hear your prayers? What goes on in your mind when the answers don't seem to come? When things don't fall your way? You know, there are some people in the church who are praying for a husband or they're praying for a wife and they have been praying for a long time and yet there's not someone coming up and so they are tempted to go and be unequally yoked with unbelievers. There are some who have been destitute and poor and they have been praying for jobs and stuff and now they get tempted to go to work on the Sabbath or to go and gamble and all sorts of trials and tribulations come your way as they certainly will come and you pray and you've been faithful and you've been diligent and you've fasted you've asked the brethren to pray for you and you see no answer 
Jesus is our high priest. And this is the word he says in Isaiah 40, 27 to 31. Why says thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Question, hast thou not heard, hast thou not known that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not, nor is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. Shall utterly fall. And then here is the word. There is the word. He said, but they that wait. They that what? Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Don't step out of the Lord's bounds and do what you know you shouldn't do. Amen. Wait upon the Lord. There may be someone, and I go back to the concept of a spouse. You have been praying for a long time and the right man or the right woman don't appear. You know the Lord may be looking and looking at all the options and say, these are not for you. They will take you out of the way. They will make your life miserable. They will, you will reach the point where you say, I'm so sorry I did this thing. So just wait upon the Lord. It may very well be that there is nothing good in sight. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Consider him. If he is the creator, what can he not make for you? If he is God, is there anything too hard for God? If he became man and experienced all that we have and knows all our weaknesses, knows all our temptations, knows all our trials, and knows just how to provide help, shall we not wait upon the Lord? As I draw near to the end, how else shall we consider him? We consider him as warrior because it was he who cast Satan out of heaven. He defeated Satan by his death on the cross and Christ will come again to reward all according to their works. The devil will be rewarded in the lake of fire and the righteous with eternal life with Jesus. And those who fail to consider Christ, those who fail to consider him, will have chosen to be with the devil. So therefore, one last consideration for today. What other way must we consider Christ? It says in Hebrews 9, 28 to 29, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. I want you to know, he came and he bore all our sins. He went back to heaven 
and he's interceding for us. But when he's coming back, he's not going to be a sin bearer. He's not going to be a sin forgiver. He's not going to be messing around with sin. All sins must be put away with. All sins must be done. When Jesus comes, he will be coming for those who have victory over sin. Those who have been cleansed from sin, who have considered Jesus in all his roles, and of by beholding become changed into his image will go home to be with him. Praise God. Consider him. What is your decision? Let me ask a question. 